The focus of this video is on cycloaddition reactions involving the addition of the excited state of a ketone or aldehyde to an alkene. These often lead to four-membered ring structures through two plus two cycloaddition processes known as oxetanes, and this is a synthetically useful way to produce oxetanes provided the reaction works as advertised. There are key differences, however, depending on the electronic nature of the alkene, whether it's electron-rich, substituted by an electron-donating group, or electron-poor, substituted with an electron-withdrawing group. And we'll explore some of those differences in this video and look at some of the more subtle aspects of regioselectivity and stereoselectivity in these reactions. So we're going to start with additions of electron-rich alkenes with excited states of carbonyls. And here by electron-rich, we mean an alkene that is either alkyl substituted, substituted with one or more alkyl groups, or an electron donating group substituted alkene with something like an alkoxy group or amino group tethered to the alkene. These substrates that contain carbon-carbon pi bonds can engage with the carbon-oxygen pi bond of a ketone or aldehyde in a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition process to form a four-membered ring. This is a fairly famous reaction known as the paterno buchi reaction. And notice that it fits our sort of nomenclature pattern of a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, 2 atom pi system in the carbonyl, 2 atom pi system on the alkene side. These add together to give a four membered ring. It is a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition process. That doesn't mean it's always concerted. That just means we end up with the combination of two 2 atom pi systems to form the product. And the product, by the way, is a four membered ring containing one oxygen known as an oxetane. Now, of course, we're interested in the mechanism of this process, and there are two broader reasons why we're interested in the mechanism. We want to be able to predict the regio selectivity is the first reason. So, for example, if I take an alkene that is differentially substituted on its two ends, I could end up with two possible constitutional isomers, or what we call regio isomers. Understanding the mechanism will allow us to make general predictions of regio selectivity in these reactions. We're also interested in the stereochemical course, and in particular, whether the reaction proceeds stereospecifically or not, under which conditions it does, and if not, what does the product distribution of diastereomers look like? So for example, if we take trans-2-butene and react it with a photoexcited ketone, should we expect the reaction to be stereospecific, giving solely the trans isomer, or will we get a mixture of these two diastereomers? Again, an understanding of the mechanism can help us appreciate this and make some predictions. The general mechanistic picture for the paterno buchi reaction is actually fairly complicated, and so we're going to step through this rather convoluted diagram sort of one step at a time to see how both singlet and triplet states can react and how the multiplicity of the excited state exerts some influence over reactivity. So the first thing to note is we're here we're thinking about the n pi star state of the carbonyl compound, so exclusively an n pi star reaction for the time being. Photoexcitation first generates the singlet state, and there is, of course, a concerted pathway leading to the oxetane, possibly through an exaplex that goes directly to the oxetane through a pretty traditional pericyclic pathway. Alternatively, we can think about stepwise pathways involving an exaplex or radical ion pair followed by a Zwitter ionic intermediate, which then closes to the oxetane. That's what you see along the bottom pathway here. And the exaplex may have some charge transfer character. The extreme of that is a radical ion pair in which an electron transfer process precedes the formation of the carbon-carbon bond. And we call this a stepwise pathway because the carbon-carbon bond of the oxetane ring is formed before the carbon-oxygen bond. And I should say, just to clarify, that electron transfer can happen from the triplet or the singlet state, as can exaplex formation. As opposed to a Zwitter ionic intermediate, addition of the alkene to the triplet excited state in particular can produce a diradical intermediate, and that's what's observed here, the triplet diradical. This can happen in a couple of different ways, with formation of the CC bond first, leading to a CO14 diradical or with formation of the CO bond first, leading to a CC diradical, and these are two different triplet diradical intermediates. Of course, to close the oxetane ring, this needs to undergo intersystem crossing 
followed by cyclization. So a complicated picture, but one that's not necessarily too off the wall given what we've seen before. We're either looking at a concerted pathway that we can think of as very sort of classically pericyclic, or a stepwise pathway involving either diradical intermediates, most commonly from the triplet state, or zwitter ionic intermediates, which are exclusively going to be formed from the singlet excited state. And of course, each of these distinct pathways has some mechanistic implications, implications for regioselectivity and stereoselectivity. Before moving on, it's worth highlighting the key orbital interactions when an excited ketone engages with either an electron-rich or an electron-poor olefin. So let's start with the electron-rich olefin. And, and here again, we're thinking about the n pi star excited state of the carbonyl. And so the n orbital is electrophilic and the pi star orbital nucleophilic. And we've seen this idea numerous times already. So for example, when we're talking about an electron-rich olefin, well, really the key reactivity of an electron-rich olefin is it's nucleophilic. The pi bond associated with this electron-rich, in this case, enol ether, is nucleophilic. And so that's going to be the electron donor side of our orbital interaction. And the half-filled n orbital of the photoexcited ketone is going to be our acceptor side. So the key orbital interaction here is between the filled pi orbital or pi type orbital of the electron-rich olefin and the half-filled n orbital of the photoexcited ketone. Notice the geometric implication here. The pi systems are perpendicular to each other to facilitate this overlap. The plane of the enol ether, the plane of the five-membered ring, is essentially perpendicular to the screen, while the plane of the ketone is the plane of the screen. This is why this is referred to as perpendicular approach. The situation is very different for electron-poor olefins because now the donor orbital, the electron-rich or nucleophilic side of the frontier orbital interaction, is associated with the carbonyl and is the pi star orbital of the carbonyl. The empty side, the orbital on the empty side of this interaction is the pi star orbital of the electron deficient pi system, here a cyano substituted alkene. And so the key interaction between the n pi star state and an electron poor olefin is a pi star CO to pi star CC orbital interaction running in this direction. And now notice that the planes of these two molecules are parallel to each other with both molecular planes perpendicular to the screen. This is why this is called parallel approach. And it's a key difference between reactions of electron-rich and electron-poor olefins, these cycloaddition processes. This whole analysis hinges on recognizing the key frontier orbital interaction based on the electronic character of the alkene, the carbon-carbon pi bond containing functionality involved in these reactions. And if we're thinking about the diradicals that are formed from these processes, it's worth pointing out that these are distinct as well. Because the interaction with electron-rich olefins involves the carbonyl oxygen essentially acting on its own, the resulting diradical is going to contain a carbon-oxygen bond and be a carbon-carbon diradical. Let's draw that out for this particular case. So the diradical we would expect here would contain a new carbon-oxygen bond and have electrons in the carbonyl carbon as well as the carbon adjacent to the electron donating group. Notice here also the regiochemical implication of this. We've connected the most nucleophilic atom in the enol ether, this has the largest lobe in the pi homo of this molecule, with the electrophilic carbonyl oxygen. That regiochemical outcome flows naturally from this FMO or frontier molecular orbital analysis. In the reaction with the electron poor olefin, now it's the carbonyl carbon that is involved in this interaction, and we should thus expect a carbon-oxygen diradical to form with one of the radical centers being on the carbonyl oxygen and the other being associated with the atom that is adjacent to the electron withdrawing group in the alkene. And here again, the regiochemical outcome is really dictated by two things. First of all, the fact that the largest lobe in the LUMO of the electron-poor olefin is distal to the electron withdrawing group. And the second key idea is that the pi star orbital of the carbonyl group is predominantly on the carbonyl carbon. And so we get selectively bond formation between the carbonyl carbon 
and the beta carbon of the electron poor olefin. Now let's turn our attention to how the reactivity depends on the multiplicity of the excited state involved. And there are some interesting stereochemical observations that we can make here. Here we're taking an aldehyde, irradiating it with ultraviolet light to photo excite it, and hitting with E2-butene or trans-2-butene. And what is found is that the group attached to the carbonyl carbon in the aldehyde has a profound influence on the quantum yield of the reaction and the product distribution of these two diastereomers. This one on the left has the two methyl groups in a trans relationship. We can see that that's retaining this stereochemical relationship in the E2-butene in the product. So let's call this the trans isomer. Whereas this other isomer that we're interested in has those two methyl groups in a cis relationship. So let's kind of survey what happens. When we start with acid aldehyde, R equals methyl, and we look at the, first of all, the quantum yield of this reaction as well as the product distribution, we see that the quantum yield is about 0.13, and the reaction gives predominantly the trans isomer. What we can say about this first reaction is it's roughly speaking stereospecific with a very small amount of the cis isomer formed as a byproduct. What we know about this reaction is that it goes through the singlet state, and we can infer this based on our understanding of the typical state diagram, state energy diagram for a alkyl aldehyde, right? Think back to acetone. This is going to have relatively slow intersystem crossing from the singlet to the triplet state, and so we can infer then that this is mostly a singlet reaction, and that once the singlet diradical is formed, it closes very rapidly to the trans isomer. There's very little time for the intermediate diradical to rotate around what was the carbon-carbon double bond, what becomes a single bond, to generate the cis isomer. This is why we observe a large proportion of the trans isomer as the product. The reaction is more or less stereospecific. So that's what happens with acid aldehyde. Now let's replace the methyl with a phenyl and observe what happens. First of all, the quantum yield of the reaction shoots up considerably. It's about five times as great when R is phenyl relative to methyl. At the same time, the stereospecificity of the reaction goes down quite a bit. And again, if we think back to our kind of exemplary state of energy diagrams and ask where benzaldehyde fits in, benzaldehyde has a relatively low-lying triplet in pi star state that is readily generated through inter-system crossing. And so we can infer from that that this reaction is occurring through the triplet state of benzaldehyde. That intersystem crossing to the triplet in pi star state is quite rapid, and reaction occurs from there. This actually explains both the greater quantum yield and the lower stereospecificity. The triplet diradical cannot immediately recombine to close the ring, and intersystem crossing has to happen first to get back to a singlet diradical. That gives the diradical time to rotate, achieve conformational equilibrium, and give a trans-cis mixture that is perhaps more reflective of the thermodynamic stability difference between these two oxetanes. And so the stereospecificity or stereoselectivity at this point of the reaction goes down quite a bit. The greater quantum yield comes from the fact that the triplet diradical will tend to deactivate less back to the ground state reactants. The singlet diradical can undergo reverse addition easily to get back to the ground state singlet reactants, and that non-radiative decay pathway that regenerates the starting materials is going to diminish this quantum yield relative to the triplet case, where once we're in a triplet state, there's no way to get back to the ground state singlet reactants. Now, what about 2-naphthal? Well, 2-naphthal is a fascinating case where the quantum yield is now very, very low, but the stereospecificity is very high. 2-naphthal is interesting because this is an example of a highly delocalized ketone with a triplet pi pi star state that is essentially unreactive in this reaction. An intersystem crossing from S1 to this T1 state is quite rapid. This is why the quantum yield of this reaction is so low. The vast majority of 2-naphthal two, two aldehyde molecules convert to the triplet state and undergo some process to get back to the ground state singlet reactants without doing the cycloaddition. But the tiny bit that do get through, the tiny number of singlets that actually do react, do so with great stereoselectivity, which would be expected through a singlet 
reaction. And so even though this undergoes rapid intersystem crossing to the T1 pi pi star state, which is unreactive, those few singlets that do survive show the high stereoselectivity, arguably stereospecificity, that we would expect of the singlet state and that we saw in the case of acid aldehyde. We also observed that the solvent can have a profound effect on the mechanism and alter both the stereo and regioselectivity of the reaction. In some cases, this may have something to do with the nature of the excited state, its electron configuration, whether that's n pi star or pi pi star in character or a mixture of the two. In other cases, the actual mechanism can be altered, whether we're talking about something going via, for example, a diradical or biradical intermediate versus electron transfer. So for example, in this case, when we irradiate benzaldehyde in the presence of this enol ether in benzene, the reaction occurs through a triplet biradical intermediate, and the regiochemistry of the reaction reflects bonding between the most nucleophilic atom and the enol ether, which is right here, far from the donating group, and the most electrophilic atom in the excited in part pi star state of the carbonyl compound, the oxygen. And in fact, both of these diastereomers have that same regio selectivity. The situation looks different when we irradiate in acetonitrile, and it's presumed that this reaction goes via electron transfer. The idea here is that we have a radical ion pair that forms before a bond formation event takes place. And so we have what is essentially a ketal radical anion together with a radical cation derived from the enol ether. What happens in this case is a coupling between the centers with the most radical density. Here, the carbonyl carbon of the ketal radical anion and this carbon far from the donating oxygen in the radical cation derived from the enol ether. This leads to the formation of the carbon-carbon bond first followed by ionic recombination that links the carbonyl oxygen, the O-, with the carbon directly adjacent to the oxygen in the enol ether, which leads to different regio selectivity. Notice that both of these regio isomers are acetals with both oxygens connected to a common carbon atom. That's different regio selectivity from the top case. So in this bottom reaction, positing that a photo-induced electron transfer process takes place helps to explain the observed regio selectivity of both of these diastereomers.